Hi, this is just a quick uh, follow-up video to the previous one I did, which I'll link in down below and at the end if you haven't seen it, and you should, otherwise it might not make sense. Um, just uh, talking about the difference be between an old tip soldering iron like this, I won't touch it, that's the hot end, and a new uh, modern technology direct uh, drive tip like this. And I, even though it wasn't supposed to be like a review comparison between the Heiko FX888 and the JBC iron here, or CD series iron, um, it, because it was not an apples to apples uh, comparison, because the Heiko is a nominal, well, a sort of, you know, nominal slash uh, peak power of 65 watt uh, for the iron itself. And the JBC doesn't say it on here, but this is has 130 watt uh, peak power capability. So basically this is like exactly double the power of this Heiko one. So it's not an apples to apples comparison in terms of uh, actual uh, power delivery for these two items. But that wasn't the uh, purpose of the video. The purpose was to show or attempt to show uh, the difference, the thermal performance difference on a uh, ground plane like we've got here. But there's something I failed to mention in the uh, previous video. Of course, the JBC one with its direct uh, drive technology worked a lot better than the Heiko on this particular uh, ground plane test. Was you know A lot of people said, well, that's just due to this is double the power. Of this one. Well, let's actually take a more subtle look at it. And I actually forgot to mention this in the previous one. I don't think it's just to do with that. So let's take a look at it. What I've got is I've got uh, both uh, set to 270 degrees Celsius here, and I've got uh, 6040 uh, solder, basically uh, the sav bit. It's got a little bit of copper, but it melts at uh, 183 uh, degrees C. Um, I've already put some there and over here on separate sides, so the um, heat doesn't interfere with each other here. And uh, the thing we're going to watch out for now is you see this little flashing dot down here, this little flashing decimal point. Keep your eyes on that. Okay, because every time that turns on, it means that the heating element inside here is turning on. So if this soldering iron is going to struggle with this uh, ground plane, the heater should be on all the time. It should be delivering that power straight in there. Um, and the JBC actually has a really nice little peak power display. You can see how it actually goes to sleep. If I put it in there, it actually drops in temperature like this, because it heats up within a couple of seconds, drops down to 280 uh, or something. But as soon as you lift it up, it detects that, applies power, and it gives you power from zero to 100%. So I'm going to assume that this is linear power delivery, so from zero to 130 watts. And we can kind of do a crude comparison. So this is double the capability. So if we see this power up here go to 50%, we can assume that it's basically, you know, more or less delivering the same power to the element as this 65 watt Heiko. So let's actually put the soldering iron on here. I'll do it at the same time. Um, if you can watch both at the same time, you may have to replay it. Um, so let's put it on here. Maybe I should get a bit of solder on there first. Oh, no worries. There we go. Just to get it started. Oh, blow the smoke away. And no, those are not lead fumes. They, that's the rosin uh, flux inside there. Anyway, watch the heating element and the power here. Okay, so I apply them at the same time. And the JBC, like, really does, like, it just instantly goes molten like that. It's really good. But the Heiko struggles. But you'll notice that the lead on the Heiko, even though it's struggling... Right? It, it, it still works. It still works okay, but it's struggling to deliver that power through. But you'll notice that the lead is not on all the time. Why is it so? And look at the JBC over here, right? We're, we're basically delivering nothing at the moment. And then we go straight on there, and it's only going to jump up to, I don't know, what, 30, 28%, 30%. I think I ha might have had it even jump up to 40% previously. According to this, um, it's it's a fairly fast response in there, but it's not even delivering the 65 watt capability of this. So you can say from this little uh, experiment here, you can say that the the difference here that we're seeing in that the JBC is providing uh, a much better thermal performance to this ground plane is not really due, or it doesn't appear to be solely due to the fact that this is. 130 watts and this is 65 because it's not delivering that full 135 
watts there. So it's not even delivering the 65 watts this one is capable of. And when you would think that this Heiko going on here, you can see, you know, it, it melts fairly quickly, but it's not, the heat hasn't spread as well as it does with the JBC. You might have to watch this in HD to actually see the molten solder uh, down there. Sorry if you can't. But, you know, trust me, this one is, you know, it still works. Okay, you know, it still does the job, but it's not, it doesn't spread the solder as well as it does over here. Right, so this gets the heat in quicker and spreads it quicker, as you'd expect, because it's a direct drive technology. The element is inside the tip. It's got proper coupling, as I showed in the previous video. So I think what we see in here is it has much less to do with the power of 130 watts versus 65 and more to do with the tip design. And the coupling of the element and the ability to deliver the power and also the uh, thermal response loops and the temperature sensor and how that all integrates into the iron. This is just the JBC and these direct heat ones are just better designed in that respect. The tips, uh, the thermocouple, the tip and the element are all integrated in there and engineered more uh, better. And this Heiko should be delivering, look, it, it just wasn't even, it didn't even detect that it, it takes longer to even detect that there's power being sucked out of that tip. So it shows that the tip actually, and this is a, um, a well-known fact of uh, soldering, if you didn't know, is that the thicker you have the tip, your bigger, like the bigger the tip, the bigger the thermal mass, it can deliver, you're better off having a nice big fat tip on there that stores the heat in the tip. And then that initial surge of heat when you apply it to the joint, comes from the actual stored uh, heat inside the tip rather than from the element itself. And only when it starts to cool down does the uh, temperature sensor detect that and starts to turn on the uh, element. And that's when you get into the control, you know, the sensing part of the uh, tip and the control loop itself and how fast it reacts and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And the actual engineering that goes into the design of the temperature sensor, the tip, and the element, and the couplings between them. Between these, look, one, two, and then it switched off. It only turned on for a second, and then it flash, flash. Why is it not on, the, or on all the time if I can feel this, like, struggling, you know? Why is that, like, why is it pulsing? Why wouldn't you apply the power all the time? So how much power does this uh, soldering iron actually draw? Well, let's take a look. This is our watts figure here. Sorry about the little uh, uh, line out there on the LCD. I have to fix that. So watch this figure when this lead comes on. Now, interestingly, when we actually power it up, let's have a look. Like six watts is its like idle uh, consumption, okay? But then when it switches on, look, it's actually like a hundred, over a hundred watts when it's actually continuously, like first heating up. So let's apply it to the ground plane and let's see what it actually delivers. You might've seen it do, there we go, 55 odd watts. So even if I just like literally leave it there, it's not delivering continuously. And I think there might be some lag between the, you know, like the update rate probably isn't quick enough to do it. But I am seeing like pulses of like 50 odd watts or something like that. So it seems that it actually is switching on in relation to this lead here, but the, just the update rate it isn't quite fast enough to pick them all. So let's do the JBC. You can see that it drew uh, six watts there, idle, just like the uh, just like the Heiko. So they're very similar in that respect. It uh, look fifty odd watts. So there you go. Oh no, fifty at 17.21, it, it jumps around a bit. There might be some pulsing currents in there. This thing's not quite um, up to the task, but you can see the difference is it's continuously applying power, whereas the Heiko was not. Why is it so? Hmm, let's go to Dave Cat. And because people will get all upset if I don't show the Weller. Okay, there's the Weller. Um, just bearing 90 to 82 watts or whatever. Just bear in mind that this is going through the 110 volt uh, transformer. So there's going to be uh, residual, uh, you know, power drawn by the transformer. So yeah, it's not going to be as accurate as the other ones. But there you go. Let's have a look. Oh, better set it to 270. 15 watts. 
Oh, no, there you go. No, jump up to 82 there. No, but it's like, it, I'd say continuously. Yeah, it's drawing like 80. Yeah, no, 15 watts with the occasional pulse up. But uh, so very similar to the Heiko, I'd say. But uh, yeah, but sort of lower. So, hmm, why is it so? I don't see huge one. And you can kind of get the Heiko to switch on all the time if you like really sponge it. Kind of, it stays on most of the time, the majority of the time, drawing uh, 90 odd watts there. So, what's actually going on here? Why is this Heiko iron not delivering continuous power to the tip here when it's clearly sucking all the heat out of it? Well, this can be explained. On a Dave CAD drawing here, so let's take a look at it. Now it's basically to do with the physical construction of these old style uh, tips like this. Here's the ceramic heater element in here, and you can probably see inside there where the temperature sensor is. Here's a uh, photo from uh, Bravo V on the EEV blog uh, forum. Thank you very much. I put some light through here and it's a clearer indication. You can actually see it looks like the temperature sensor elements up there. So it's embedded inside the ceramic. So the ceramic heating element will be kind of here and then there will be a sensor up the uh, top there which is kind of where you want it because it's like right at the, you know, you want the sem sensor to be as close to the tip as possible. But if we actually have a look here at what's actually going on, now I've done a whole video explaining all this uh, sort of stuff and you know R theta and all this uh, sort of jazz, so I'll link that in at the end of the video, watch that. It's a tutorial on theme of thermal heat sink design and some of this may not uh, make sense if you ha you know don't know uh, your thermal basics, but basically um, we have a heat source here and it's equivalent to a resistance circuit, so the heat is effectively the current flowing through these thermal resistances. This is what R theta here is, they're just thermal resistances resistances and voltages are like temperatures here at the different points in the system. So let's have a look at the physical uh, construction here. We have the heating element inside the ceramic here, then we have the thermocouple up near the tip here, and then of course we have the, you know, all like kind of loosely coupled. It is a, re you know, there's a little bit of play in there, but not a huge amount, but it basically slides over. So we're going to have thermal resistances at each of these points. And it doesn't matter what the values are, but let's actually have a look. So we've got our power source here generating our power. We've got a thermal resistance between the heating element and the actual tip. That's inside the ceramic. It's it's going to be reasonably low, uh, for example. But then uh, from the sensor, so we've got uh, the temperature of the heating element, the temperature of the sensing element, and the temperature of the tip. And the thermal resistance, the coupling, between this ceramic element and this tip like this is going to be quite high because of this old style technology and the loosely coupled nature in there. You know, air gap and, you know, there's like, you know, it's it's got some contact and then it's got to radiate out and, you know, there's going to... So this uh, R theta from the sensor to the tip, that's what R theta ST means, from the sensor to the tip and the heater to the tip, this is actually going to be quite large in these old style tips. So what happens here is that of course because the temperature sensor is the one that's part of the control loop thing, and I won't go into control loop theory and all that sort of stuff, and this is crude, please excuse the crudity of this model, didn't have time to build the scale or to paint it, um, the tip is not in the feedback loop like that. So when uh, the heat drains out of this tip, when you put it on a big ground plane and the heat starts draining out, it, it notices this temperature dropping and then of course it increases the heat uh, in here in the heating element and then the, but the temperature sensor is going to, because this thermal resistance is small and this one's high, this temp the temperature of the thermocouple inside here is going to reach that set point, say it's set to 270, the, it'll apply more heat, It'll re this will reach 270 before the tip does. So that's why it thinks, oh, I'm going to, I'm at 270 degrees, I'm going to switch off the heating element. And that's what we saw there, even though we were still draining 
the heat continuously out of this tip. It was kind of like oscillating there because that's part of the feedback loop and this is a high thermal resistance. I hope that makes sense. Now let's actually have a look at the Weller because it's actually a different design. You'll see that inside there is the sensor and that goes inside the tip like that and the heating element is around the outside. So it's actually a different construction and in theory it should actually be better than the Heiko design which has that um, uh, temperature sensor integrated into the ceramic element and just relies on the heat radiating out to the tip. This time the heating, you know, this is a bit crude, I don't know the actual physical uh, construction inside but this is what it looks like. The heat has to go to the tip first and then to the sensor inside. So that makes more sense. So in theory it would be taking the temperature from after the tip here. It should work better than the Heiko, but as you've seen in the performance uh, tests, that it basically works almost identically. You know, there's not much uh, difference between them, and the Weller doesn't deliver the power all the time. It cycles as well. Uh, just like the Heiko one. So I don't understand whether it's a control loop issue in the Heiko doing that, whether it's, you know, it's not fully explained by this because it should be better than the Heiko in theory. But, eh, it's not. Now, these more modern uh, design tips, as we explained in the previous video, work somewhat differently. They're all integrated. They're, they're better engineered because there's no loosey-goosey coupling of this over there. It's all integrated in the heater is uh, integrated into the ceramic and then the copper slug inside the tip. I don't exactly know where the temperature sensor in here and it's actually not going to differ a huge amount from this ex these existing uh, systems here in terms of uh, the thermal, like the uh, response and loop and everything else, it's just the engineering of the tip is better. So it's going to have a lower thermal resistance going from the sensor uh, to the tip. And, it, you know, it, it kind of, like, it really gets complicated if you want to analyse the design of these things, but they just fundamentally work better. And because so many people mentioned in the previous comments, there is a different technique to these uh, ceramic heating elements, either the old or the new type, and that is uh, what's used in the Metcal. I'm not sure if um, too many others use it, but Metcal are uh, famous uh, for using it. That's why Metcal have a lot of uh, fanboys. They actually use RF induction, so it actually, uh, I believe it's like a 13 megahertz or something, very high frequency, that actually magnetically inducts uh, uh, power into the tip itself and then it uses a Curie point system so they don't have adjustable temperature irons they actually have uh, just like a fixed point and to change the temperature you've got to change the tip but a lot of people claim it's better because you don't need to change the temperature and look I prefer adjustable temperature irons I'm not saying the Metcals aren't great they are great I have used them they're fantastic but I just prefer having the flexibility of adjusting the temperature temperature without having to physically change the tip. The Metcal tip cartridge contains a heater that consists of a copper core and an outer layer of magnetic alloy. It's the composition of this special alloy that predetermines the tip temperature and keeps it regulated at the solder connection. Surrounding the heater is an inductive wire coil through which an RF current is passed. A phenomenon known as skin effect causes the current to be confined to the outer layer of the magnetic alloy resulting in high resistance that causes rapid heating. As the alloy heats up, it approaches its Curie point temperature. This is a physical constant at which the alloy's magnetic properties change. As the properties change, the current spreads through the whole heater, reducing the resistance, which effectively reduces the power delivered. This immediately stops the heating effect. During soldering, as the tip cools, the alloy falls below its Curie point temperature and regains its magnetic properties. The skin effect immediately returns, increasing the resistance, and heating begins again, repeating the cycle. As this occurs, the tip self-regulates very close to the Curie point, plus or minus one degree Celsius at idle. The temperature can never exceed the Curie point, just as water will only boil at 100 degrees Celsius, regardless of the amount of heating power. In effect, smart heat regulates the amount of power delivered to the solder joint. The result is a system that responds dynamically to thermal loads and requires no calibration, 
Smart heat systems apply direct power to the solder joint. I think I actually forgot to mention in the previous video, these traditional uh, tips are like the cheapest uh, solution, but potentially don't last as long because uh, unless you've got like a, a smart pullback um, a system which actually cools the tip down uh, between joints, but because they can't heat up fast enough, you can't really do that. Whereas these are the next uh, expensive, well, these are kind of like the most expensive solution with the integrated uh, tips, and these, but these can potentially last longer. So whether or not it's a cheaper solution in the end, Eh, that's up for uh, debate because these should in theory last longer because they have that um, you know setback thing when you put it back in the iron it can cool down to a lower temperature and then it heats up again once you pull it back out of the stand it only takes uh, two seconds and Bob's your uncle um, and that should in theory uh, give you a longer life tip because it's basically you know, the higher the temperature you run these at the greater your uh, wear on the plating and all that things all things considered and then of course you've got the uh, the Metcow type R Curie point tips. The problem with those is that even if they're cheap, you need a lot of them because if you like to use many different styles of tips, not only do you need all the different styles of tips, but then you need all the different styles of tips in the different temperatures required for the particular purpose that you've got. And you can't always use, you know, the lowest temperature. Sometimes you want to do really big stuff and you need the bigger ones. But anyway, tips and solder and iron technology, like, eh, come on, that's, there's a reason why all these different ones exist. So there you go, I hope you found that uh, little follow-up interesting, and if you did, please give it a big thumbs up, and as always, discuss it down below, because I seem to have hit a sore point with soldering irons. Hell have no fury like soldering iron fanboys. So yeah, Go for it. Go on. <laughs> I do plan to do follow-up videos, and yes, stop asking about the TS100 soldering iron. I might get one, and I might get a review on it, but it is not a replacement for a bench soldering iron, no matter how good its thermal performance is for its open source 60 bucks or whatever. It doesn't have the nicely integrated, um, uh, you know, proper burn proof flexible lead and everything else. It doesn't even come with a power supply. You just got to use whatever. It's pro I have no doubt it's great as a portable soldering iron, but as a bent, as a replacement for a good quality, solidly engineered bench soldering station, no way. Catch you next time. <laughs> Look at all the flame comments down below. Go on, watch them. All the TS100 and Metcalf fanboys are going to go wild.